What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to the Kenny For Real Award Week. Yesterday, we started off with Rookie of the Year, and I got to admit, the mentions kind of went crazy after that one. Some good, some bad, regardless. Um, I'm excited to bring you Episode 2, which is Defensive Player of the Year, man. For the first time since probably college, which is 2016-ish, I created a spreadsheet. And you know what? Low-key kind of proud of myself, man. Like I said, I take these things very, very seriously. Oh, and even in saying that, I still get things, like, objectively wrong. Like, yesterday we were talking about all rookie teams, and I think I, I had Jalen Green on the first team over Josh Giddy. That was an oversight by me. So even though I take these things very seriously, I am very far from perfect. And I want you to remember that as well. I am just a guy that watches some basketball that happened to have a microphone and a camera. You might disagree with everything I say. That is completely okay. It is just basketball. Today we're talking about Defensive Player of the Year. And I guess all defensive teams, too. That is the reason I created this spreadsheet, because well this year for me defensive player of the year is not as straightforward as some of the previous seasons whether it been uh Rudy Gobert last year Giannis before that Rudy Gobert the two years before that Kawhi Leonard's years um Draymond Green's year it seems like every single season it had been relatively straightforward on who the defensive player of the year is and the way I always gauge this is like I'll go back to watch our podcast my podcast um all-star on the, there I go again uh, uh award shows and if four people who watch basketball are in a consensus of this award, then it was relatively straightforward, right? I think this year we're going to do that same exact show, and three out of the four of us might have a, a different defensive player of the year. That's how ridiculous it is this season. And I think one of the reasons it is that case is because Draymond Green was running away with this award very early on in the season, and then boom, he got injured, and then he missed months of basketball, and because of that, he is not the runaway defensive player of the year anymore. So when I say I got a spreadsheet, I'm being very serious there, man. I'm not a guy that typically looks at advanced stats and, and all of the things, but I think it was important for defensive players of the year because of course the eye test matters for sure the eye test matters in a lot of things in my life but defensive player of the year is that unique award that like you need to pair it with the actual statistics to match it but even in of course statistics can be flawed right the way you interpret and statistics can be completely different and when it comes to advanced statistics specifically defensive statistics it's going to weigh heavily on the bigger players and when you get to my all uh, defensive teams you're going to kind of see that man it's hard to pick guards to be in the the overall conversation the only guy or the last guy to do it was Gary Payton and and there is some buzz for Marcus Smart being a defensive player of the year this season which is great Marcus Smart is the the communicator the the perimeter guy on the best defensive team in the NBA a team that if you dis discount the first month and a half of the NBA season is the greatest defensive team in the history of basketball he is the vocal point, he is the attack point, he is the aggressor, he is the the hustle guy. So I understand him being in the conversations, but other than that, there, there's not a lot of guards that like jump off the page when it comes to all defensive teams or defensive player. The, of course, there are an extreme amount of very talented guards in the NBA. It's just hard. So I'm going to start off with some of my honorable mentions. These are the guys that did not make my two all defensive teams, right? Um, and, and, and I'll explain some of the reasons because one of these dudes, I'll just start off with him. Alice Caruso might be a homer pick, but if you watch Bulls basketball at all this season, you can clearly understand why him and Lonzo Ball, like I'm a pair of them together, um, are the most, some of the most impactful on ball defenders in the entire NBA. If you go deep into the advanced analytics, Alice Caruso is top three when it comes to a point of attack defender in the entire NBA. And the reason why he's not on my two all defensive teams is because he's only played a thousand minutes on a season. And I went back on like my last last year all defensive team and compared it to like Matisse. Matisse Stiebel was not a player that started last season but he was undoubtedly on my all defensive team and Matisse Stiebel even last year as a rookie coming off the bench for the 76ers still played about 300 more minutes than this year's Alice Caruso and the same thing with Lonzo Ball who has a little bit more minutes but he's missed the last 40 games of the season or so so those two dudes because of the smaller sample size did not make my list. You're going to see some people on my list that still do have a small sample size but it's I don't know. I don't want to phrase this the wrong way. It is a combination of kind of this legacy thing and me knowing. It, okay, it's Draymond Green. And like Draymond Green, like I said, he was the runaway for Defensive Player of the Year for the first half, you know, one third of the season, whatever you want to say. And then he got injured. And then he came back and he's still a good defender, but his sample size is smaller than some of the people that aren't on the list. But it's because I know. 
that even though Draymond Green's sample size is small, that Draymond Green is that dude defensively, right? You know what I'm saying? So I'm taking his personal resume into account when saying that he has a smaller sample size, but he gets a pass because of it. Another guard that missed my list this season um, but deserves some consideration is Fred Van Vliet. He had been a guy that has been at the top of the list or towards the top of the list on deflections this entire season, and he is another smaller guard who I like to show love to because he uses, the, like, the, the fact that he's not super athletic or super tall, it's a lot of this on the defensive side of the ball, a lot of him putting his body on the line on the defensive side of the ball, and I like those players, but I don't have him on my all-defensive team. And another dude, a guy that had been a consensus all-defensive team guy for me for the last maybe three seasons is Drew Holiday, and he deserves some consideration this season, but I do not have him on my final ballot. Remember, we're talking about four guard spots, and, and for the first time in my life, I kind of stretch the rules a little bit. Now, I'm thinking about all NBA teams. Again, I'm, I'm, it's a little late here. When we, we talk about all NBA teams, some people that you, you see as a Forward also classifies as a guard. So one of my final guards is actually a forward, but he was, he's such a damn good defender that putting him on the second team would have been like a crime against nature. But he also is maybe not better than my two forwards that I already have of him, but he classifies on the official ballot as a guard. I guess it's the same thing with like the Jokic and Joel Embiid thing. And I think I've come out and said publicly that I don't like the idea that they're allowing Jokic and Joel Embiid to both be classified as forwards. But here I am kind of going back on that because I want this player to be an all-defensive player. Regard it's my ballot, damn it. All right. So let's talk about the forwards that didn't make it but deserve some consideration. Um, Jason Tatum is a super versatile defender. Um, when you go into the advanced stats, he's one of the most versatile defenders in the entire NBA, and he's a very good player at that. If you want to know a cool, a cool statistic, Scotty Barnes, the most versatile defender in the entire NBA. He's a rookie. Most versatile defender in the entire NBA, according to the advanced statistics. The next guy to deserve some love that didn't make my list is Royce O'Neal. Self-explanatory every single season. He's like the only guy on the perimeter that gives a damn on the defensive side of the ball for the Utah Jazz. And that did not change this season. The next one is Dorn Finney-Smith, man. And I desperately, desperately wanted to get Dorn Finney-Smith on one of these teams. But I just don't have a place for him. And I'll, I'll explain that later. As, as good as he is, I just... It's hard for me to take him over the other four forwards on my list. Next, Herb Jones. Shout out to my rookie guy. He had um, another point of attack guy that was towards the top of the statistics. And then uh, uh, Aaron Gordon, one of the most defensive, versatile players in the league. And lastly, Vando Jared Vanderbilt deserves some attention. But, of course, these guys did not make my actual list. And when I go over to centers, uh, the two guys that I have is Jared Allen and Yaka Potom. Okay, with that being said... Let's get over to the official all defensive list. And I like I said, I still don't exactly know who my official defensive player of the year is. And I might go with a default answer because maybe the simplest answer is the right answer. OK, my all rookie first team guard is Marcus Smart. We already talked about him being such an impactful player on one of the best defensive teams of all time. Or if you take, you know, change the sample size a little bit. Marcus Smart deserves to be on every single. He should be a unanimous. Oh, I, I forgot to mention Patrick Beverly, too, on guards. My fault. He should be a unanimous, unanimous all-defensive guard. Whether you have him on your first team, on your second team, there should not be a single ballot that's talking about guards that doesn't have Marcus Smart at least in there. My second guy, and this is where I start to talk about me stretching the boundaries of positions, is Mikael Bridges. The, the Phoenix Suns 100% deserve to have an all-defensive player. They have been one of the top two, top three defenses of the, of the entire season. But the, the one thing about Mikael Bridges, which makes it very interesting, and this is why I always say that advanced stats should be a part of the thing, but they shouldn't be the, the, the be-all, say-all. Because if you look at it, technically... The Suns are a better def defensive team when Mikel Bridges is off the floor. When you watch them play, he has taken the assignment of the best player on the opposing team, whether he be a small guard or whether he be a big wing. Mikel Bridges taking that assignment, and he's doing a damn good job on it. So the advanced, it's the advanced statistics might not love Mikel Bridges, but the eye test puts him over that. This is where things get interesting because I have I have three forwards that I, I really, really love in this spot, but of course I had to narrow it down to two. The first one is Giannis. Um, Giannis's case for Defensive Player of the Year is definitely there. And like I said, I might default to Giannis once at the end of the video when I give you this last one, but it's not an overbearing 
um, overbearing. I'm 100% convinced that Giannis is their defensive player of the year this season. Uh, they have been around the number 10 spot in defense all season long, which is a, a drop off from them in the previous seasons or the drop off from when he was defensive player of the year. But this year he had to change up his entire defensive role because Brooke Lopez went out the first game of the season. So we had to see him basically change throughout the season of him being a defender. And then what I liked, and I, this is kind of just a one game thing, but we saw this throughout the season. I remember uh, in the playoffs last season when Kevin Durant was going ballistic against them, one of the things that was trending on Twitter is like Giannis just won defensive player of the year last season. And you're trying to tell me he's not checking Kevin Durant. Well, what we saw so far this season is no, he might not start off on Kevin Durant or even take a ton of possessions on Kevin Durant when it comes to one-on-one -on -one things. But when the time comes down to it, He's going to take that assignment. Or what we saw in the game just from last week, he might not start off on KD. I think it was Wesley Matthews on some of those possessions. But what they did is they figured out, hey, we're going to throw Giannis late as a help defender and, and double him. And Giannis is the best in the league as a help defender. There's a reason why they allow him to play free safety because he's so damn good at it. So he deserves to be first team for me. And he might be my defensive player of the year, maybe. Before I even give you my second wing spot, because uh, my second forward spot, I think that, like I said, there's a two-man race for that second spot I want to transition to my lock for the first defensive center and that is Rudy Gobert oh I already see the comments in the tweets Kenny you gonna pick Rudy Gobert an all defensive first team after Terrence Mann dropped 40 on him in a very important elimination game and and then you tune into the Utah Jazz and you see Isaiah Hardenstein going at him or Paul George going right at him nobody fears Rudy Gobert maybe that is true but there's a reason why why when he's not on the court the Utah Jazz are a below average team on the defensive side of the ball. And when he is in there, they're pretty damn good. It's not as good as last season. This is why he's not my defensive player of the year. But it's pretty damn good. And I want to remind you guys that this is a regular season award. And, and in the regular season, Rudy Gobert is the most impactful defensive center in the NBA. That is a number saying that. And that is the eye test saying that for me personally. So he is a lock for me to be an all-defensive first-team center. Next, let's talk about this last forward spot. Because there's two players that I, I, I really want to put in here. But, of course, I already can narrow it down to, two, to, to one. Uh, the first one. Is Bam Adebayo. Yes, I understand that Bam Adebayo is a center, but like I changed up the positions for Mikel Bridges legally, by the way, legally changed up the positions. I'm doing the same thing for Bam Adebayo because he's as impactful as, of a defender than pretty much any other person I could have put in a forward spot. And since he classifies there, why the hell would I not? The the, the only knock on on uh, Bam Adebayo's case is like he missed a chunk of the games with some injuries and stuff. But this is a year where I'm kind of putting that on the back burner unless it is such a significant amount of time, like an Alex Caruso. So Lonzo Ball case where they both played like a thousand minutes. Bam on the bio this season, 1,700 minutes in 54 games at this point. So, he, you know what I'm saying? He might miss about 18 to 20 games this season. Regardless, he still put up 700 more minutes than some of the people I nixed out of it. And Bam Adebayo is such a great defender. Um, he's the most switchable defender in the entire NBA, whether it be onto guards, whether it be onto forwards. The, U, the Miami Heat in general, I think I was listening to low, the low post and they were talking about it's like, uh, Bam Adebayo is number one when it comes to switchability in the NBA, and then it's like Tyler Hero, and then it's Bam Adebayo, oh, it's uh, Duncan Robinson, but the difference is the points per possession when Bam is switched on is significantly lower than, than Duncan, who's like the worst of all time. Damn, I'm sorry, Duncan. Shout out to the homie. Uh, but Bam Adebayo just impacts the game so much on the defensive side of the ball, and since I could put him at forward, I will put him at forward. And the other guy that was in conversations for the spot, of course, I, I ended up going with Bam on the first team, is Jaron Jackson Jr., Jaron Jackson Jr. is a guy, I think he's leading the league in total blocks or, or blocks per game that has been his thing. And, and he has some position versatility as well. He's played a lot of minutes at the center position. He's played a lot of minutes at the forward position. But the reason I like Jaron Jackson Jr. more this season than any other year, he's a lot smarter on the defensive side of the ball. And we're going to talk about another player on my list that is, has grown this way too. We're like early stages of, of Jaron Jackson Jr. He was in crazy foul trouble. And even this year, it, it's not completely down. It's not like, bro, don't foul out because – he still does, but it's, it's a, it feels a lot less this year than any other season. He's blocking shots all over the place. He's switching very well, and he is very good on his rotation. So, I, I, unfortunately, he had to end up on the second team, but he's on the second team, J Jaron. Shout out to you. Yeah, his fouls per game went from 3.8 to 3.5, so... You feel me? <laughs> Shout out to what's his name? Trip is that and that his rap name? Trip. 
All right, so we already found out one of my forwards on my defensive team. Let's talk about the second forward. It's Draymond Green. I already mentioned my case for him. He, he had it wrapped up in the first quarter of the season, third of the season, whatever you want to say, um, and then he missed some time. But I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt because we all know that he is as elite as anybody on the defensive side of the ball, whether it be him as a vocalizer, whether it be, be him on the switches, him being guarding all five positions. Draymond Green is still that. But let's go a little bit forward because – I, I got a very similar situation to last year. Like I mentioned, Matisse Stiebel. Oh, Matisse Stiebel's on my second team, by the way. But uh, his rookie season, Matisse Stiebel made my team um, playing around, I think it was 1,400 minutes on the season. I might be rounding up a little bit for him. He played about 1,400 minutes, but he was such a menace on the defensive side of the ball that I had no choice but to add him to my second team last year. He's on my second team again this year, and, and I wanted to fit him in, but I... I respected Mikel Bridges' this season on the defensive side of the ball just a little bit more. If you got Matisse on the first team, I completely understand it, but I went with the homie Mikel Bridges on the first team. Matisse Thibault is just as dominant this season as last season, but his minutes are up because he's starting a lot more games. So shout out to Matisse. But like I said, this is a similar situation where my second guard on my all-defensive team is a guy that doesn't play a ton of minutes. Um, he's actually a guy that kind of loses his spot in the rotation every once in a while, but he might be the best perimeter defender in the NBA right now and it's Gary Payton the second this season Gary Payton the second has played 1100 minutes so even that is a lot lower um than some other people that that's uh, that puts him in the range for reference of like Alice Caruso and Lonzo Ball but I think this man is such a menace on the defensive side of the ball that I would be it would feel weird to me to not have him there Similar to Matisse last year, I don't expect anything from him but to hound the opposing team, and he does a damn good job at it. If he got the sample size of 1,700 minutes, there's no way you can't put him on the first team. The only problem is because his offense is so bad, he doesn't get the minutes, but I'm not going to penalize him <laughs> for being a terrible offensive player or just a bad offensive player, um, but man, he's ridiculous. And my second team center is the Time Lord Robert Williams. A couple months ago, I went on to TNT, um, and they gave me a two-minute segment to talk about who I thought the sleeper team in the Eastern Conference was. And in this, this was like when the this is when the Boston Celtics were maybe in the middle of their big run, right? I think in that they were like nine in their last ten, and they were climbing up the standings. And, and I asked the producer there, is there a limit to what I can talk about? And they said, no, be yourself, do your thing. So I spent basically two minutes talking about Robert Williams on, on, on TNT, which is great because I don't think he gets a lot of, of PT or, or FaceTime on these national televised games and people don't really talk about him enough. But he deserves to be here because uh, through, halfway through the season, Ime Udoka figured out that, that Robert Williams as that same help defender position that you got Giannis in or you got Bam out of bio win. Robert Williams is playing that same exact role on one of the greatest defensive teams of all time. I can understand you having him on first team over Gobert. I wouldn't fight you on it whatsoever. Um, but he deserves 100% to be a center here. And I, I don't see an argument for anybody else other than Gobert and Williams. Maybe Jared Allen got to vote because they were a very good defense. And then he went down and then they still had Evan Mobley, but the defense was still trash. It, Jared Allen might have a case, but over the, the two guys that we got, I, I don't see it. So getting back to the, the real question, who is the defensive player of the year? I guess I'm defaulting to Giannis, but I, I, would, I haven't done this research here, but I would guess that if Giannis won defensive player of the year, it would be one of the, the, one of the worst defensive teams to get a defensive player of the year because they're sitting at the 10th spot. I don't know that for sure, but maybe. I, I guess my runner-up would, would probably be Bam. Sample size a bit small, and that might hurt him. Then Bridges, nah, then Smart, then Bridges. I don't know. The, the winner is the only thing that really matters, right? And even that, as you can tell from my tone, doesn't really matter to me too much. I'm more invested in the all-defensive teams than the actual final award. But hey, man, I'm just a, a guy with a spreadsheet in front of him and a little bit of the eye test. Um, let me know in the comment section who you think deserved to be here that probably wasn't here. Uh, and I'll be down there like I always am. You can tweet at me if you want. Just don't be reckless, dog. Please don't be reckless.